I'm Dr. Mandy Weevil, and I'm part of our OBGYN team, and there's Dr. Rudolph and Dr. Jewell. Um, so we're each going to talk about a different area of our specialty. I'm going to start off with obstetrics, and we're doing a lot of new exciting things in our obstetric world, so I'm going to touch on those. And then Dr. Jewell is going to talk about all of the GYN surgery that we do, and then Dr. Rudolph is going to bring us home with all of annual exams, general GYN, and women's care that we do. And you can stop me at any time if you guys have questions. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna talk about all of our new and exciting things that we're doing in the Family Birth Center. And that's just our, we call it the Family Birth Center. It's basically the labor and delivery um, unit that we have at the hospital. Um, so in 2018, we delivered 314 babies. Um, our C-section rate was 11%, which is really significant because if you look at um, the country, it's about 25%, California about 23%. Um, and there's a national push to decrease your, the C-section rate, and we have knocked it out of the ballpark. So um, that's one of the things that we are really proud of. Um, and so, yay for us. Um, <laughs> so another thing that is one of the like healthy people goals, you know, that, that are always out, I think it's like 20, healthy people 2020, um, they want more women to breastfeed in the United States. Overall, we have lower rates of breastfeeding than other um, developed countries. And so our um, breastfeeding rate was 92%, which is incredible. If you're looking at national averages, it's somewhere like 60, 70%. And benchmark, they really just want us above, was it like 80%, 85% or something like that. So we're doing really well at supporting moms in breastfeeding. Today was World Breastfeeding Day, and we had a nice ice cream social, and we're really out in the community trying to promote breastfeeding and all of the, um, uh, the benefits of it. Um, also, our induction rate, which was really <laughs> hard to calculate because I had to go back through a lot of charts, um, was 16%. So I could not find what California induction rates were, but national, it looks like numbers anywhere from 25 to 35%. And induction is when we actually put, have to get someone into labor. So they're not going into their own labor. We're inducing them into labor for a variety of reasons. A lot of people contribute this to higher C-section rates in the United States, so they're also wanting people to lower their induction rates. We're well below the national average. We really you know, only try to induce our patients for a medical reason, like if they're having high blood pressure, diabetes, the baby's, baby's growth issues. So um, we're doing a good job there too. Um, so our new policies and new things that we are doing are cesarean section recovery. So when I started, I've been here six years ago, when I started, um, if a mom had to have a C-section, we delivered the baby, the mom would see the baby for like a few minutes in the OR, and then the baby would go back to like the nursery with the dad, and the mom would go to the recovery room, and they would be separated for that like first hour of the life. And we know that that actually is not good for bonding, it's actually not good for breastfeeding promotion. So we've changed that policy, and I still have patients that like ask me about it because they remember like, oh, that was so traumatic being separated from my baby, so now we're not doing that anymore. Once the baby's delivered, it goes to the warmer, we make sure that everything's okay, and then we bring it to mom to do what's called skin to skin, where we put the um, baby directly on mom's skin in the operating room, and that promotes breastfeeding and creates um, bonding. It actually is, um, decreases rates of postpartum depression, um, and um, actually just, and also pain control for mom as well. Um, and then the dad or the partner, whoever, um, and the baby stay in the OR the whole time while we're finishing up the C-section, and then they go as a family unit back to their room on labor and delivery where they're monitored so they don't have to be monitored in like a recovery room setting without their baby. So that's one of the things that we've changed and we're, we're happy about that. Um, one of the biggest policy changes is that we've started doing VBACs, and that's a vaginal birth after a cesarean. So um, it used to be that if you've had one C-section here, and um, you would only have the option to do another C-section here. If you wanted to try to have a vaginal delivery, you had to either go to Renown or to UC Davis. And you know, as you can imagine, if you're going into labor and having to drive those distances, that's really difficult to do, not, and also not the safest. 
Um, and so we looked at numbers in the community. We found that patients in the community were either driving those distances or trying to do it at home, which is also not very safe. Um, and so we looked at the numbers. We looked at our ability to do an emergency C-section because the risk of a VBAC is ending up in a very stat emergency C-section, which we can do at Barton. So we're like, why aren't we doing these? Um, so why? So some patients ask me, well, why would I want to do that? Why, if I've already had a C-section, isn't it easier to schedule and plan another one? So you don't have any of the risks of surgery. So that's the risks of blood loss, the risks of having scar tissue, damage to surrounding organs, the risk of infection. Um, you have a lot shorter recovery. Obviously, you don't have a big abdominal incision. Um, and a shorter hospital stay. So typically for a C-section, it's a three to four day stay after delivery. With a vaginal delivery, it's a one to two day stay. Um, less risk of a DVT or a PE. So these are blood clots in your legs or in your lungs. Um, and it's better for future pregnancies. So for moms that want to have a big family and multiple children, each time you do a C-section, it creates more scar tissue and more scar tissue. Um, it weakens the uterus and it makes each pregnancy a little bit more high risk having that many C-sections. So if you have one VBAC and you can continue to have vaginal deliveries, it doesn't really put a limit on how many children you can have. Um, and then it's pretty successful. So 70% of women that attempt to try to have a vaginal delivery after a C-section will be successful in doing so. And then um, the risks. So the big risk is something called a uterine rupture, and that's where the um, scar on the uterus from the previous C-section breaks open in labor. And that is a stat emergency because you have to get the mom and the baby to the OR right away because you literally have like a minute um, to get the baby out. And it can cause really extreme blood loss um, and life-threatening injuries to the infant if not caught early and acted on earlier. Um, and then, so everyone's like, well, if it's only less than 1% of uterine rupture, then why are only 70% successful? So this is not the only reason why we would take someone for a C-section. It's the big risk. But you still have the same risks of having a C-section in the first place. That is failure to progress, meaning that your cervix just isn't dilating. Um, or sometimes the baby can be stressed out during labor. It's not related to a uterine rupture, but it's just the baby's not tolerating labor. So since we've adopted this policy at the end of last year, we've had um, 10 attempted VBACs and eight of them were successful. So um, we've been doing well. The other two, one was for fetal distress. It was not a uterine rupture. And one was a patient that just did not dilate. Um, and then new policies, so this is something we're working on, so we don't currently have this designation yet, um, but it's called the baby friendly designation. You've probably heard about it from other hospitals. Um, and so this is directly from their website. It really is a breastfeeding promotion um, thing where we're, uh, it gives mothers the information, confidence, and skills necessar necessary to successfully initiate and continue breastfeeding their babies. Or safely feed with formula it gives these special recognitions to hospitals. And one of those things is recovery with mom after a C-section right away. Um, we're doing skin to skin right in, you know, right after delivery. Um, a lot of the things we actually are already doing. Um, and it's just more education on breastfeeding for us doctors, the nurses, even the pharmacists, because they have to actually, for baby friendly um, hospitals, they keep the form the formula locked up in the pharmacy, and so the pharmacists actually have to release it if needed. So that's how much it promotes breastfeeding. Um, and then we just have to change some like small, minor, just newborn policies that we have um, to promote this. But those are, I think, yeah. So that is everything new and exciting on OB. And any questions? All right, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Jewell. She's the newest member of our team, and we're so excited to have her. She's going to talk about GYN surgery. Is this the down button? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Meg Jewell. Nice. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's such a lovely evening. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about gynecologic surgery, and um, my mother-in-law asked me today, even though I've spoken with her many times about what I do, uh, you do surgery? 
<laughs> we do surgery. What is a gynecologist? So we're physicians who possess special knowledge, skills, and professional capability in the medical and surgical care of the female reproductive system and its associated disorders. So I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the most common surgeries that we do, and then I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on robotic surgery. So one of the most common procedures that we do is a hysterectomy, and that's removal of the uterine body. It can be partial, where the cervix is left behind, or total, where the cervix is also removed. And it can include the removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes as well, although we sometimes leave those in place. Hysterectomies um, in our facility are often performed in a minimally invasive way because we want patients to recover faster there's also less risk. So we often perform our hysterectomies laparoscopically or vaginally or robotically. Very rarely are we doing an open, big incision across your lower belly to remove the uterus. So um, on this side here is a picture of a laparoscopic hysterectomy and then a robotic hysterectomy. We also perform surgery on the adnexa, so the fallopian tubes and ovaries. And the top picture is an example of a very large ovarian cyst. Um, we perform tubal ligations, removal of tubes and or ovaries, and these procedures are usually performed laparoscopically unless you have a super large cyst. We also perform myomectomies. A myoma or fibroid is a muscle cell tumor in the uterus. And these are often performed robotically or abdominally. These are just some examples of where fibroids can be located in the uterus and an example of a robotic removal of a fibroid. And then another very common procedure that we perform is hysteroscopy. And this is where a small camera is placed into the uterine cavity. It's used to evaluate abnormal bleeding or treat um, abnormalities such as polyps or fibroids. This is a picture of what a uterine polyp looks like. We can also perform additional procedures at that same time, like endometrial ablation, which is burning of the lining of the uterus for heavy bleeding, or a curatage or sampling of the uterus to check for abnormalities like cancer. And then I just want to briefly touch on robotic surgery. When I was in medical school, learning about robotic surgery, I thought this really crazy, like how can a robot do surgery? And I like to explain it to patients, it's not really a robot doing surgery. The surgeon is still in the operating room, we're just at a control panel. And these are the instruments that are placed into the patient's abdomen. And it's like doing laparoscopy, um, but the surgeon has special controls over how the instruments operate. Some advantages for patients are shorter hospitalization. They usually have reduced pain, faster recovery, and return to normal activity. There's a reduced risk of infection because the incisions are really small, reduced blood loss, and minimal scarring. And there's advantages for the surgeon. Uh, there's greater visualization. The camera with the robot is 3D. Uh, there's enhanced dexterity because the instruments, unlike in laparoscopy, they're wristed, so we can move the instruments in a 365 degree rotation. And there's greater precision, so removing adhesions um, or really difficult, very large uteri can be more easily moved. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah? So, um, so when you have a hysterectomy, Sometimes what can happen is you start to get a Yes. So can you talk about that? I mean, is there a way to prevent that from happening to women at the time when you do the hysterectomy? So it is not a very common complication, um, but can happen. And there are some certain risk factors such as age, obesity, genetics, smoking, that can increase <laughs> your risk of having a prolapse. Um, at the time of surgery, there are some techniques that we can, you know, perform to try to prevent that from happening, but it doesn't always happen in every situation. Uh, we don't perform the bladder repair surgeries. That's a specialist, a urogynecologist. That's a great question. 
Anything else? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Claire. Hi. Um, I'm Dr. Claire Rudolph. I'm the last of the trio. My godmother is here today. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so I um, am going to talk about some things that are not quite as flashy as inpatient obstetrics or GYN surgery, but I think also really kind of the bread and butter of what we do, which is our office practice, particularly our office GYN practice. And I can't tell you how many times I talk to people then when they're, you know, like, oh, do you have a gynecologist? Do you see someone for an annual exam? And, you know, a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding of do you even need to see a gynecologist? Do, how often do you need to see one? Is your annual exam, isn't that just my pap test? Which now that we've had a change in our pap test, which is the cervical cancer screening guidelines, where we moved from doing that every year to every three years, I find that a lot of people just aren't going to their GYN as frequently. And I think that we want to make sure you guys know that it's so much more than just doing a pap when we see you for your well woman exam. Um, so um, at the, the well woman exam is really kind of designed as this preventative healthcare screening. So similarly, if you see an internal medicine doctor, a lot of women um, who are otherwise young and healthy may not have other medical problems. So an OBGYN is kind of your primary care pr uh, provider. So we kind of take on that role and really want to help to provide this opportunity of the well woman exam to help you maintain a healthy lifestyle. Um, we talk about how to minimize your health risks. Um, we talk about good habits early on for your bone health. And then also talking about staying, kind of assessing body weight, eating habits, um, and help people just feel good about their bodies. Um, some of the other health screenings that we do, and a lot of them just kind of happen automatically, you know, the first thing you do when you come to our office, you meet our medical assistant, they'll ask you why you're there, and then they'll take your vital signs. And with that, we're screening your blood pressure, um, your height and weight. Um, we may also offer diabetes screening, depending on your age or risk factors. Um, for women who are more than 10 years postmenopausal, over the age of 65, or who have other risk factors, we may screen with a test for bone density. Um, and then we offer screening for sexually transmitted infections to all of our patients. Um, and we also do screening for depression. Um, there are cancer screenings that we do, and we kind of base these based on the age um, recommendations. So cervical cancer, um, which uh, is one of the more common GYN cancers. Um, screening, we start at age 21, um, and you will continue to have screening. It's recommended through the age of 65. Forever and ever, we did the pap test, or pap smear, which is really taking a collection of cells from the opening of the <coughs> cervix. Um, and it's now put into fluid rather than spread on the slide, but put on a, into fluid, and then they look at the cells to see if they look abnormal or not. Um, one of the biggest kind of additions to cervical cancer screening in the past few years has been the real identification of the correlation between human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. And so now we do routine HPV testing or testing for the high risk strains of HPV with your pap test. For women between the ages of 21 and 30, HPV is very common. About 70% of people who are sexually active will at some point in their life test positive for it. You can decrease your risk by limiting sexual partners as well as getting the Gardasil vaccine, which now protects against nine different strains of, H of HPV. Um, but we do that testing with the cells and only test for HPV if there's abnormalities. After, and that's done every three years if it's normal. After age 30, we do co-testing um, automatically because it's that if that HPV has been present, if it hasn't cleared on its own, that's when it's more likely to cause long-term abnormalities. So we do co-testing, and in general, our practice is to do that about every three years. There is some variation in the guidelines. You can do co-testing every five years, but I think that for patients and providers alike, it's a really difficult um, paradigm shift to go from annual pap testing to now waiting every five years based on kind of new data. So it just seems like an awfully long time to wait. So we kind of meet the happy medium and do co-testing every three years. Um, and then if you have had all normal pap tests and have had regular pap test screening by the age of 65, that's very low risk for you to get cervical cancer. So it's um, at that point, the likelihood that you would get cervical cancer is so low that it's actually okay to stop getting a pap test at that time. 
Um, we also offer breast cancer screening, um, and breast cancer screening kind of comes in two forms. Um, we call it, you know, increasing breast self-awareness, so helping women understand their personal um, risk factors, their family history, helping them understand how to do a self-breast exam so they get aware with what their normal tissue is, um, and then also doing a yearly breast exam, a clinical breast exam in the office with um, a primary care provider like us. At starting at age 40 um, is when we start to recommend routine screening mammograms every one to two years for average, average risk patients. Um, and then colon cancer screening is the other big probably uh, cancer screening that we offer. Um, we recommend that starting at age 50. That can be done one of three ways. Um, there's two non-invasive screening tests. One's the FIT kit, which is a stool sample that's done annually. The Cologuard screen, which is actually a mail-in test that's also a stool sample, but it's done more discreetly because it's mailed to your house. Um, that's actually good for three years. Um, and then there's the colonoscopy, which is the gold standard. Um, it is, allows them to directly visualize the colon as well as provides you the opportunity to treat any polyps right at that time where if you if that are found so if you have a fit kit or a cologuard that comes back positive for blood you ultimately end up needing a colonoscopy and the colonoscopy is generally good for most patients for up to 10 years so even though it's a little more invasive you cut kind of a longer pass with it um, Besides the well woman kind of cancer and health screenings that we do, the well woman exam also provides us an opportunity to help people um, talk about kind of the more routine things, things to help them to know what's normal with my period, um, helping them to understand how to get relief if their periods are painful, to know are my periods, why are my periods too short, why are they too close together or too heavy. Um, and then other ways to also to deal with pre uh, premenstrual syndrome. Um, a lot of times we don't know what's abnormal because it might be normal for us. And then when we sit and kind of take that history and ask people how, you know, how frequent are they? How long do they last? What's the average flow? It's a jumping off point that we may not address that problem completely in that visit, but allows us to help identify an issue that we can follow up in future visits. Um, we also um, are probably one of the few physicians that really focus on sexuality and relationships. Um, so we ask personal questions and we keep things confidential personally, but a lot of people talk to their gynecologists about things that they might feel not as comfortable talking about with other physicians. So we screen everybody to see about having safe and healthy relationships, helping people understand what relationships might be harmful or threatening to them, um, as well as talking about other things like pain during intercourse, the hormonal changes that we experience throughout our lifetime that may change our response or interest in sexual, uh, sexual activity, as well as different types of, of sex. Um, we also spend a lot of time talking about fertility and pregnancy, helping people to optimize some of those other health screenings like blood pressure, diabetes, body weight, um, to help them plan ahead to have the safest and healthiest pregnancy is one of the most important things. Um, Preconception counseling, we talk to people about their diet and lifestyle, um, any medical or family history things that might be pertinent, what medications they're taking that they may want to avoid while they're attempting to conceive, as well as supplements. Um, and then also taking the history of their past pregnancies to see if they might need to see a specialist prior to becoming pregnant, uh, pregnant this time. Um, we also help people when they're having a difficult time getting pregnant and help to understand what's normal, how long should it take, and at what point do I need to be worried about um, uh, if I'm not getting pregnant on my own. And at what age, and that might differ by your age. For women under 35 in general, even when everything is working normally, well, all of the guy checks out, every, all of your press stuff checks out, it still can take up to 12 months to conceive naturally, and that is normal. After the age of 35, we generally start to recommend a workup if it's been more than six months, just because there are some higher risks of, of things at the, in that age group. And we also help women who might find themselves pregnant um, unintentionally or accidentally know what their options are. Um, we, birth control is a main <coughs> component of that, of helping plan and um, optimize safe and healthy pregnancies. And there are so many different types of options of birth control these days that it's really where it can kind of help people tailor what birth control fits them and their lifestyle and their medical history and their desires. So that could be, is it a hormonal or non-hormonal method? Is it short acting or long acting? Um, is it something permanent like a tubal ligation or a vasectomy? Or is it something that you want to have to be reversible later on? Um, there are also many medical reasons that we use, um, particularly hormonal contraception, um, to help treat some of those problems we talked about earlier with pain, with periods, or heavy periods. 
Um, we do lots of other things too. You had mentioned prolapse. While we don't perform prolapse surgeries, um, we do help um, evaluate prolapse. Um, we do a lot of referral for physical therapy, which can help um, prevent prolapse as well as treat early signs of uh, kind of early stages of that. We also provide um, pessaries and fitting for pessaries, which are silicone or plastic, um, kind of rubbery plastic devices that are able to help treat and alleviate the symptoms of prolapse without surgery, and then also provide you a referral if you do find um, that you would like to have surgery for prolapse. Um, we talk a lot about menopause symptoms, whether that's mood changes, hormonal changes, hot flashes, night sweats, some of the memory problems, things that come up. We talk with patients a lot about that, what to expect with menopause. We offer hormone replacement therapy, including FDA-approved bioidentical hormones. Um, and then um, we also make sure that people know that things about vaccinations like for the flu and particularly the HPV vaccine. Um, the HPV vaccine initially, when it first was rolled out, protected against four strains of HPV. Two that cause genital warts so that are low risk and two, the um, two most common that cause cervical cancer. Now it is, um, and it was only offered to women who are under the age of 26. Now we could have a vaccine that protects you against nine strains, so seven strains of high-risk HPV, and it's available to all women up to the age of 45. So I've been trying to remember to bring that up at Well Women Now because there's a whole group of a gen like group of women who weren't offered that when they were in their teenage or early 20s, but are still very much el eligible for that and may benefit from it. Um, so I had already gotten my Gardasil, but I'm planning to go back and get another one. <laughs> so. Um, that's kind of it for me. Is there any questions? Can you just talk a little bit about uh, menopausal, postmenopausal, and the hormones? Yes, so um, I gave a whole nother talk on this um, a couple months ago, but yeah, so menopause is, on, on average in the United States, average age of menopause is around the age of 52, um, and it really is kind of the natural decrease in the functioning of our ovaries. So. Menopause is defined as 12 months um, without any birth control or other things, but 12 months with no periods. Um, around that time and leading up to that is kind of the perimenopausal transition. So a lot of people experience the symptoms of menopause or per perimenopause um, as your hormonal levels are starting to kind of fluctuate more as that decrease is happening. Um, hot flashes is one of the most common symptoms that women experience that can start um, several years before menopause really um, is finalized, and it, it can extend for up to seven to 10 years after menopause happens. Um, so um, that's probably, I think, one of the more common things. And then there's this whole host of other more subtle symptoms, like this feeling of brain fog, this feeling of difficulty sleeping, um, uh, vaginal dryness and decreased libido are also very common things. And so we spend time kind of trying to help tease out what the underlying issues, whether it's all attributed to menopause, whether it might be attributed to other medical problems, or also a lot of times other things that are going on in our lives at the same time as menopause, because it also tends to hit us like unfairly at this time in our lives when like lots of things are changing. Um, so I think that that, that, I mean, it's so hard to kind of go over the main decrease, it's a decrease of estrogen in our bodies that kind of triggers those symptoms. So the best treatment for menopause is our like hot flashes and symptoms is often um, estrogen therapy. And if you have your uterus, have not had a hysterectomy, you would also need progesterone to help protect the lining of the uterus. Um, but not everyone is interested in hormonal treatment. Um, uh, and so we also have other non-hormonal treatments that can help with those symptoms too. And yeah, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for coming. Um, I hope it was helpful, and we look forward to seeing you all. <laughs>